All right. Good afternoon. This is Jason Thomas with, with America Makes. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to now uh, hand it over to Scott Krynoff with America Makes to get us started. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm Scott Krynoff. I'm a senior project engineer with NCDMM America Makes. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to this TRX webinar series today and the subject of don't be late to lightweight uh, designed for additive manufacturing presented by Altair. A uh, little bit of background with Altair is Altair is a global leader in computational science and artificial intelligence that provides software and cloud solutions and simulation, high performance computing, data analytics, and artificial intelligence. Uh, also, Altair also enables organizations across all industries to compete more effectively and drive smarter decisions in an increasingly connected world, um, all while creating a more sustainable future. We'll, we'll have two speakers today um, from Altair, uh, Jadeep Bangle and Tony Gray. will be reviewing Altair's capabilities and the use of their Inspire software for design for additive manufacturing. Uh, Jadeep is a technical director for Altair, uh, and he has over 15 years experience with computational fluid dynamics, optimization and manufacturing. Uh, his career journey has taken him from an analyst to messenger of upfront design engineering tools to help engineers understand design and manufacturing simulations to help support improvement uh, in the product development cycle. Uh, Tony Gray is also a technical director from Altair New Zealand and has over 25 years of experience in the practical application of, of optimization methods with an emphasis on innovative design, weight, and cost reduction, along with improved product performance. So we want to thank all of you for joining, and then I want to thank uh, Jadeep and Tony for joining us today to, to present Altair's capabilities, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, Jadeep, if you want to go ahead and take over. Perfect. Hey, thanks, Scott, and thanks, Jason, for the nice introduction. So let's get started with, um, you know, the today's topic, which is, you know, don't late to be too lightweight or designed for additive manufacturing. Now, before we jump into all the discussion, I want to show you some of the, the challenges in 3D printing world, what our customers um, look look around um, or what they see. So, you know, you see like about the cracks, the crack propagation, parts failing, um, the bad surface finish, or sometimes just the cracks uh, propagation. We also see in a snap lines, you know, where two or three different layers, they they basically misalign at, at certain points. And, you know, it happens because of um, stop and st stop and go uh, on the printing side, or thermally induced stresses, which are unevenly cooled layers. And then you will start seeing these these uh, bad bad uh, issues or bad bad snap lines. Anytime you see this, this is a basically a, you know you throw throw out this part and you start all, all over again. So we'll we'll talk about these you know some challenges as well as how to avoid these challenges in the real world. Uh, now, another thing you will notice, you know, especially on the social media, social media is in, inundated with all really nice looking parts, beautiful looking parts, 3D printed in metal, plastics, everything. But no one talks about what it takes to manufacture the, those parts, uh, what it takes to print those parts successfully. You know, uh, some of these examples you see, even from Altair or our, our own users, from automotive to aerospace OEMs, they could generate or they develop these beautiful designs. But when you actually get into the details about how those parts were printed, uh, it becomes a nightmare um, with the support structure wastage, with the powder wastage, with the amount of labor that needs to clean up those parts. It's it's that that's a quite a bit of effort. Um, so I'm going to just throw out this number on the screen. So this number represents the cost associated with 3D printing, um, that's wastage. The wastage because of the because of the powder that goes waste, because of the support material that needs to be printed, time involved, that's a waste of time uh, printing, you know, the parts, the, 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 those are not critical for the actual component, like supports, and also the labor, labor um, hours where, you know, um, somebody has to basically work on those parts after they are printed, hopefully successfully. Now, saying that, this, this is exactly where we as Altair team develop a process and uh, we emphasize more on the design for additive manufacturing than just randomly create a beautiful looking part and then trying to figure out how to print that part successfully. We are, we are basically saying, 
think about that process way early in during the design part. Just going to share a few examples from our customers. This was a, done by Nissan, uh, Nissan Automotive. This is a radar bracket. The actual bracket, the original bracket was manufactured using the stamp component. Again, the stamping is cheap, but the second part, which is 45% lighter, was designed for and manufactured with binder jet uh, 3D printing. So again, it was actually the, it was overall cost was much cheaper for the given amount of uh, the production parts over the year. Another example for from the BMW, uh, one of the brackets there, you can see some some statistics about the stiffness, weight reduction. But for me personally, the biggest uh, difference or the, the advantage was the way that part was designed was with a zero support volume. That means somebody prints this part and then take that part off the print print uh, uh, plate and start using it. And that's what will again uh, my my colleague, uh, my friend. Tony Gray will emphasize more during his presentation about how to design parts for additive manufacturing. Just one more example on the different way of 3D printing. It's polycasting and casting. So it's taking a based from the both the worlds where someone uh, use a 3D printing or first of all, even optimize the part, generate the design, which is very optimal, very efficient, and then 3D print that design into polycast material. And then take that and create the mold die in a you know with the sand, and during the casting process, the first first step is basically melt this polycast material, which gets you know with the heat and everything. It just become ash and it drains out, and that material the the, the process becomes a casting, a traditional casting. So you get uh, based from both the worlds from three D printing get very complex, very lightweight part. And for casting, you get the best material properties, which are proven over the over the time. Now, for us, for you know Altair, and for a lot of our users around the world, they follow this process for design to manufacturing. You know, uh, so what what it means is during the design phase, they are thinking about manufacturing the parts. There are two ways engineers design the part today. One is designing from scratch, or designing from existing component. If I'm designing from existing component, you know, I run a quick baseline simulation. Then from the baseline simulation, uh, we create something called packaging space, design space, with the largest possible sandbox to play with. And from there, for the given operating conditions, worst case scenarios, the solution, the Inspire, our optimization tool comes up with the best possible design, most optimal design. But it's not always most efficient for manufacturing. But that's when we can force the tool to use manufacturing constraints. How I want to manufacture this part? Maybe I want to use uh, casting as my manufacturing uh, uh, process. Maybe machining, maybe injection molding, maybe stamping, or maybe uh, printing simulation or the printing, 3D printing. And depending on that process, this Inspire comes with a different designs. And you can see, again, we will talk about those designs as we go with the Tony's presentation. But even before I do anything with those designs, I want to run two more important steps in that workflow where I'm going to run manufacturing feasibility check. Maybe it's for um, a printing simulation. Maybe it's a casting simulation to identify the defects very, very early during the design phase in the manufacturing and try to fix those defects during the design phase. We don't want to wait for the end of the you know the production part or production process to find out that there are problems. And then we run a quick validation step, run a quick FE analysis for the same given uh, um, the components uh, or the operating conditions, run FE analysis, see the new component satisfy my design criteria, and then finally send it to the manufacturing. So this is a very easy to follow uh, design cycle. That's our users around the world use it today. Anyone can use it on and off. That means you can run only say FE simulation or manufacturing simulation or run through the entire uh, design to manufacturing um, um, part. Now, saying that, this is a good example of the same exact bracket, but manufactured or designed for different manufacturing processes from conventional casting to machining to powder bed, laser melting, sand mold, but there's a hybrid casting uh, method, FDM, as well as meter binder jet. There are uh, very subtle changes on the designs for that manufacturing process, especially in the 3D printing world. To achieve this, Altair has different manufacturing feasibility simulation 
solutions from casting simulations to metal forming, injection molding, polyurethane foaming, extrusion for metal and polymer, and additive manufacturing. The whole entire idea about this manufacturing feasibility simulation is to identify defects and fix those defects very, very early during the design cycle. So at this point, I have to um, invite uh, my, my friend, uh, Tony Gray, to get more into the details of uh, design for additive manufacturing. Tony, go ahead, uh, take over whenever you are ready. While Tony is taking over, anyone, if you want to type in your, you have questions, feel free to type in those in the chat window, or we, at the end, we'll keep some time open for the Q&A. But feel free to uh, ask your questions or type in your questions as we go. Tony, over to you. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen. Um, do I need to be given permission? Permission has been uh, transferred over, so you should be good to go. It's is it sharing? It is now, Tony. Yep, yeah, it is now. Out. Good. Sorry about that. I don't know what was going on. Um. So, hello everyone. Thank, thanks for attending. So, yeah, thanks JD for the introduction. So, um, I'll talk through um, my slides on on design for additive with Inspire. So, start off with a bit of an overview of, of what I'll do. So, I'll, I'll give you an introduction, um, give you some thoughts on designing for additive, which I've been doing for a few years now. Uh, go through the processes and strategies for optimization and talk a bit about geometry. Um, I've got one example that I'll work through the entire process to kind of tell the story. Uh, and if we've got time, I've got a, got a bunch of extras I can um, go through as well. So just, just a little bit of background on me. I, you know, there was the introduction, but essentially I've been working uh, predominantly in automotive for over 25 years um, doing design optimization. Um, and in the last two or three years, really, really focused on the design for additive side of things, but I'm really, you know, the thing I'm passionate about is the um, sort of the practical application of these methods and, and finding out, you know, how, how to actually apply them to people's people's problems. So, you know, I, th I thought I'd throw this slide and this is where it all started for me. I was working at Ford in the UK in the mid nineties um, with an in-house code. Um, and we had, we had a transmission mount bracket that was failing. So it was, it was quite late in the design process and we had this this cool bit of in-house topology optimization um software that i'd never used so I, I dove into it and within weeks we'd redesigned the bracket it, it worried a few people because it looked different uh, we saved 100 grams uh improved the performance which was really good uh, recent numbers there are around 1.3 million of it produced so just that one bracket alone saved you know Two hundred sixty thousand dollars, roughly, um, with a, an average aluminium cost over the years. So, you know, late in the process, it's always it's always worth light weighting. And one of the key things is you're, you're often when you reimagine these designs, you you get improved performance. So again, in this case, it was cast, but um, you know, this the methodology is is manufacturing um, agnostic, really. So so it applies to everything. So a few years after that, I joined Altair and, and my colleagues in Germany uh, published this example with VW. So that this was the process. So it was, you know, you start with your design space and your non-design space, you put your loads on and even looks like images from old software. You get your, do your topology optimization. It's pretty, pretty chunky. You, um, you know, try and simplify that a bit. Then you try and get some geometry out of it. And eventually you, you recover some geometry. You take it through preliminary design and then then you do size and shape optimization to tune it up and the sticking point then and i'd say it's still the sticking point now well two points is getting getting a good representation of your optimized geometry out and then being able to manipulate it through to your final design so that was difficult 25 years ago and it's still you know one of the hardest parts of the process now so sort of if claims of the one click results to production um is kind of like selling snake oil i think so this is this is a um a version of jdeep's slide that he showed of, of the entire process so nothing has really changed it's it's got yeah you know, it's slicker the the imagery looks better um and 
One of the key things, and it's, it wasn't explicit when JD talked about it, at each of these stages you want to gather um, the performance information of your parts, and you also don't want to be jumping backwards and forwards between different software. So JD sort of mentioned the Inspire suite of software. It's all it's all the same GUI, um, and and kind of easy easy to use as well. But I don't you know I don't want this to be a, a software presentation that's kind of showing our process over the years. So we and I'll touch on this a lot. We we use something we call a DDM, a design decision matrix, and it can be any tool that you like of just gathering the performance data at every stage. And you notice I've got all these iterate um, little circles in it, and, th and that's the reality of it. You you do iterate at these different points of the cycle. Um, there is no, you know, one one button to get a design. Um, and this is, you know, this this is one one of the the ribbons from uh, from Inspire, so it's very easy to use um, environment, and basically it's, you know, Inspire has managed to pull all these kind of complex CAE tools together in, in one very easy to use environment, so that, that's kind of the software demo part of it, uh, probably. So in the last two or three years, I've, I've discovered a few things about designing for additive, and I think the key thing is that there is no one size fits all, and I've, you know, I've, I've researched and found images and these you know these are just just a couple of them there are so many different um technologies and there's new technologies arriving every week there's so many different companies and each company kind of approaches uh things in different ways sometimes uh, people are learning very quickly you know knowledge can be outdated um very very fast so to say this is how you design for additive is and here's a button to do it is is not feasible um, so you need a good robust process and that's hopefully what I'm presenting today. Also, something I've learned is that most of the people that have developed processes, EX1, Desktop Metal, um, Renishaw, you, know, you, you name it, Stratasys, um, even the sort of the, the minor players like MX3D with their WAM process, they will all have design guidelines so wall thicknesses height to thickness ratios you really need to understand those requirements at the beginning of your design process because if you don't capture them you won't be able to print your design at the end so you know very very important so some of the common things that that we, we come across that you know people come up with it you know can i redesign this and 3d print it the first one it's it's really yeah, obvious. It has to fit within the printer or the furnace volume. Um, cost is always a challenge. Um, JD touched on the, the deformation and sort of faults in the printing. If it's say binder, binder sinter, you need to depowder. Um, there's all different processes, different support um, requirements. And um, this this whole integrated integrated support structure. I've I've got some slides on that. We'll see how we go for time. Um, I can talk about specifically designing for that as well. Um, just balancing designs, minimum, maximum sections, and then, then there's that, how many can I get, you know, if I want to nest them, do I want a low CFG to stop them falling over? So, you know, there's, there's all these different methods, all these different manufacturers, different operators, different requirements, it all adds up to you can't, you know, just get that answer out of an optimization. So you need to have a process to get good geometry that you can edit to then meet those requirements. Um, so again, that's that's one of the things we'll be be touching on. So one one of the key, again, the key thing, and it's it's not just for additive, but it seems to be more predominant, is that there's always this trade-off with: do I want the absolutely optimum lightest part, which generally requires either support or um, you know, binder center setter kind of structure, so the absolute lightest part versus something that's really easy to manufacture minimal or minimal support structures but it'll be heavier because you've kind of integrated the support in there so you know with these minimum support structures um you can actually end up with higher material usage because of all the supports print times can go up costly really costly the post processing of of support structures it can add up to a huge amount of time not just removing them but then cleaning up the the what's what's left behind so it's good for one-offs low volume um, 
but as soon as you start getting into high volume, it's you've definitely got to try and you know design with minimal support structures. Eliminate the post processing if you can, like the the um, BMW example that was shown, um, and you absolutely need to do this if you're going for for high volume parts. Um, so I'll touch on this again, and JD touched on this, but you know, we we like to think of the the kind of sandbox idea that you can you can play with different op options of you know draw direction, um, split draw direction, uh, row hand constraints on. So for each of these manufacturing constraints applied to your design space, you, you'll get very different um, different topology results, and and that's a good thing. That that means you can explore your designs and and hopefully come up with something that suits suits your process. So, talking about geometry, it's it's really critical to the whole process. Um, this is something I th I think about uh, a lot about how to get geometry out of optimization and and. I just put this together a few days ago to try and <laughs> clarify my, my own thoughts as much as anything. And you know, geometry is expensive. Detailed CAD is expensive. You really want to do it, you know, once right at the end of the process. We um, we have a guy, one of our technical managers, said a few years ago, it's like computer aided documentation. You just want to do it once at the very end. So at, at the beginning, you when you're just exploring, you don't want to be investing. In geometry, you want you want that to be as automated as possible, and and we have that. We can really quickly one click reassess these designs. It's a, a mesh based approach, um, so it's really good for comparing concepts. And you know the cost is is very very low. Then you want representative kind of geometry. You might want to take it into a system model, a weights model, just just to you know check things out and and compare designs. So this is. This is where we've got some automated geometry tools, and I'll, I'll touch on them as well. So, you know, as you move up the complexity, then then you want to simulate manufacturing. So details like like fillets start start to matter. So you need to you know capture your key geometry. You don't you don't have to do you know tolerancing on on machine faces and things, but you want to capture most of your geometry um, to do these manufacturing simulations, and then and then. Kind of iterate maybe for some shape optimization as well, and then you're right at the end. You want to compare your your final performance or your your, your part performance. You want to take detailed CAD in there. So it's only at this very end stage you go go for really detailed um, CAD to confirm your final design and go to manufacture. So increasing fidelity of geometry through the process is a really kind of key thing to understand. So I did. Touched on the um, automated processes, so we've got something. Excuse me. Um, called auto auto polynerbs. It's really good for concept visualization, quick feasibility. Um, you can you know, take these geometries into your casting printing simulation before you you know go into some detailed stuff. Um, you can you use it to improve your or ease the process into manual. Um, geometry creation as well. It can be difficult to edit. It's hard to manipulate in CAD, and it's it's literal. There's no real you know, design judgment in there, but it's really good for first look um, evaluation. And then then there's the manual polyner, but it's, it's just I guess it's a form of CAD in some ways. Um, so you can again manually edit the these geometries, and when you get good at it, it's not not that hard. It does take practice. Um, you can work the aesthetics. You can ensure you control your overhangs. Um, you know section section balance, um, and the result of it is really CAD friendly. So quite lightweight geometry. You can export that, take it to the CAD um, for your final detailing, um, which, which is is pretty much always required because people control their designs in CAD. So we've got these these two approaches that that kind of work and work through the process. So here's the um, you know the the example that hopefully ties it all together. Um, that's a story I've told a few times. I've I've tried to just reduce the the content a bit, so it's not, as I say, not a software demo. It's it's more a process um, demo. So you know, whenever you get one of these optimization projects, you need you need to understand what's required. You know, you need to if if you've got a current bracket, you want to put it you know in its environment. Do do the analysis, understand how it's performing. If it's something that you know is performing well, that's a really good baseline for your future design. If it's um, you know 
failing in service, you might you might take the opportunity to Im improve you know, or lower the stress in it, improve the safety factor. So you need to understand you know, the design requirements at the very beginning. Um, so in this case, it's yeah, it's just a made up case, but we want a safety factor greater than three. Um, we want to use additive and uh, we want to use an aluminium um, material for it. So that, that's the basis of, of the design. So the um, the next thing, and this this is this is one of my my pet um, pet things to talk about, and I, I can talk on the subject for days. So um, it's it's difficult to get it down to twenty minutes, half an hour. Um, but getting the physics right. So whatever you're optimizing um, or solving, you've got to get the physics right. If you don't get the physics right, your answers are meaningless. So uh, it doesn't always have to be this is quite complicated. Um, this is actually quite simple within Inspire Motion, but we've taken this bracket and we've put it we've put it in the system because as the bracket moves through its range of motion, it see it sees different loads. So we we want to capture um, capture the physics correctly, uh, what, whatever it is that you're solving for. So again, this is this is the you know the baseline analysis. We've we've done done the motion model. We've we've extracted the the performance of it, and um, we can see that the safety factor is actually up. Well, actually, that's not the safety factor. Um, it's the, the stress, but the safety factor was around um, 4.36, and we know the mass. So, yeah, it's it's a relatively simple process. But again, this DDM, we want to capture that data. This is our baseline. You need you need to record your performance at each, at each stage, and it's a process that we use. We've been using it for 25 years, and you know, our customers use as well. Just capturing the performance data. So you've got your baseline, you're, you're starting to clarify what it is you want to get, get from your design. Um, so you can start for, formulating your, sorry, formulating your, um, your optimization problem. So we've decided on aluminium, um, you need to develop a package space. Um, what's your objective? Usually it's reduce weight and reduce cost. Uh, Want a safety factor greater of three? That was in the in the brief, and we've decided to print it now. Often, people often talk about exploring you know, many different materials and uh, different manufacturing processes. What what I generally find is that people have a preferred material, and they've got a manufacturing process that they'd prefer to look at at least at the beginning. They might change that later on, but at least to start with, they they have their material and their print. Not to say we can't explore those things, but it's, again, it's just something I've, I've generally seen. Um, so again, this is just a bit more detail on that on that DDM. You want to capture throughout the process all these different designs. And, you know, and again, the numbers are made up in here, but you, know, you want to track cost, you want to track performance what's what's most important at the end and sadly a lot of simulation um, is bookkeeping you need to you need to track this stuff you need to keep your keep your files in order um, but that's it kind of underlies it's boring but underlies the the whole design for anything process so we've got our baseline there we've got our requirements so one of the first things you want to do is develop your package space so i'll, I'll set both these videos I'll set this video again. Um, so a fundamental concept to topology optimization, if you're not familiar, is that you need, you know, the the parts of the model you can't touch, and then the parts of the model um, that you want to perform topology in. So this this is actually uh, videoed at about um, twice real time. The speed is so it's not. You, know, you can see it's a pretty pretty straightforward process. So it's defeaturing um, and partitioning the model. Um, I'll that's almost finished. I'll let it go. So what we're trying to do is is build design space and non-design space in the model. So almost finished. So design space. So the the brown is designable material, and the green is non-designable material. We can you can also do this in CAD and and drop it back into your model. Very simple process. It'll maintain all these connections and loads from your like your baseline model. So again, won't detail it here, but very clean process to stop having to repeat kind of a um, model set up at, e at each stage. So you've got your um, you've got your design space and your non-design space. You've put it put it in back into your 
baseline run model. Again, always do this. Just check everything's still connected, and yeah, it takes takes two minutes to run, so it's no it's no um not an onerous thing to do. You've got that set up, and then then you can run your optimization. So again, not not a software demo, but there's, we've got many ways of setting these up. You can have multiple different kinds of load cases. It'll consider all of them. One of the easiest ones is just to maximize your stiffness um, for a given amount of material. You can control the size of members. Um, and again, because this is a motion model, we want to extract loads at, at um, sort of different points throughout the throughout the range of motion. So you can launch your optimization, and again, depending on the complexity of your of your um, design, it, it could take one minute to a couple of hours, depending on what what you're um, what you're doing. But again, in the, this case, the the results came back in in the order of five to ten minutes. Um, so you can see there you've got your your um, topology optimized part and in, in your system again the physics are, are maintained and are correct and then you want to know how this performs so again early in the process you're going to be evaluating lots of different concepts maybe you know, it's kind of smart smart guided design you, you look at one result before you move to the next one so you don't want to be investing in geometry and uh, I'll we'll stop that so we're not distracted. So we've got just a single, you can just click this analyze button and that does an FEA or an analysis based essentially on this geometry here. It doesn't doesn't do any complex smoothing or fitting. It just, just gives you a really quick performance estimate. So your stiffness is generally good. Your stresses around you know concentrations and singularities, they'll they'll be um they'll be high, but you can get a general idea and compare compare part to part and again this is a single button click it, it takes it takes some um, you know seconds to run quite often and again it's really quick to go through so keep using that maximize for a given percent of material of you know just just done different runs here so you can start to look at your models your results you can you know identify um, bits of geometry that are always in there so I haven't got Lots of um, detail on that in the presentation, but you could you could from this identify that this region here is always in your model. So you might change that to a non-design region, and that that could help when you um, just get get a more refined, resolved um, design at each stage. So again, it's, it's a very iterative iterative, project, iterative process um, that you need to go th go through. So you know, there's different different things you can do for for 3d printing to to kind of use those um, different or look at different results set optimizations up differently so again um, the, this is the one, one of the parts JDEP showed you know, the, the six parts on the slides so this was the setup for SLM printing so it was designed with with a um, an overhang constraint so trying to reduce the over overhang once a print direction had been established. Binder Sinter, um, using, just looking at the results, you can often kind of assess a good direction. You can you can use um, extrusion constraints and draw direction constraints to kind of resolve those a bit better. Um, sand casting, again, the, often it's it's defined by your, um, the, the draw direction constraints and stuff like the polymaker it has virtually no constraints on it. Um, it does have, it's a really, really flexible process. So you know, these no constraint designs are the most optimum and everything else is a step back from that to get something that's manufacturable and, and um, yeah, and, and doable and, and cost effective. So again, back, back to this slide, you can look, you can look at the, the free one. So this is, you know, this is the best you'll get probably. Um, you can interpret this in this case you can interpret I could maybe do that with binder center and have have the bottom surface under there as is, is um, flat on the furnace um, again this printing vertically and you could identify this as a, a kind of an integrated support structure so this is you know we, we like to think of a sandbox um, that you just you play around with different different designs and it's easy and you can quickly establish and, and edit your geometry and, and come up with um with, with your best designs so that this is just again looking through the process i'll in the interests of time i'll i'll fast fast forward it a little bit 
but again, this is this is actually running real time on that result now. Um, and I can just change the viewing of it while while it's running. It's again in the order of 20 to 30 seconds and it's run. So we've really quickly got an assessment of, of this design. We can we can check the weights of it, you can check check deflections, um, stresses, that kind of thing. So very quick to go through, set up different you know, different optimization, design space constraints, the print direction, the, the casting, use different percentages of material. We can do it with safety factors on, but again, really quick early assessment of, of the validity of your designs. And let's go on to the same slide again. So you know, I was I was in a meeting 15 or more years ago. Um, I was talking about OptiStruct, which, which again is underlying all the all the solvers, all the solving and Inspire has got OptiStruct under the hood, so it's been around for 25 years. And in one meeting, I got three best quotes ever. He goes, "Oh, you know, it was OptiStruct, but you know, I've paraphrased Inspire. It's a thinking tool, so you you can you can use it to help help you." You know, think through your designs and what's required, and that, that's because you get these geometrical ideas really early. And then he goes, "Oh, it gives you hindsight at the beginning of the process," and that's 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 really it's really true. And the you know, the other one is that it's not the final answer, but it gives you a really robust starting point. It it stops you going down down the wrong track. So, you know, you've got these these cool designs. You've you've hopefully assessed them in your DDM, and you want to you want to take them forward. So you start to need Better geometry, um, you know, and it's an iterative process, and you need to be able to to edit that geometry to take your designs forward. So that that's this is kind of the next the next phase of the process. So we've got again this this auto polynomial process. I'll I'll start the video, and it can can run through while I talk. Um, but it's just a few simple steps, and we've actually made it a little bit simpler than this video was showing. Um, but from your optimization results. You can really quickly, and by quickly, probably one one to five minutes, depending depending on your part, you can get really good representative um, geometry. Um, it's really good for doing early um, kind of early assessment. Um, you can take it, you can take the geometry into CAD systems, do do weight weight analytics, um, that kind of thing. So it's you know it's not perfect geometry. But it's it's really good represent representative geometry as a, a starting point to to like go to the next level. So I'll just fast fast forward this one now. We've we've actually automated a lot of the steps in the latest release, so you can even go in and, and start sort of detailing and, and doing fillets and things. So this is kind of the final final detail geometry, and and it's really really useful. It's not you can't edit it much. You could take it into CAD and use it as the baseline, um, but again, you know, it's really, really good. But you can't edit it. You need you need to be able to edit. It. So again, this slide highlighting you know, all the things you need to consider for 3D print, and you can't generate that or you can't capture that with automated processes. You know, it's still, we need human in the loop, and and I think we will for at least a few more years. Yeah, you know, it, it's it is actually complex. You know, design is um. Not always as easy as we'd like to pretend. Um, so again, we need this way to manipulate high fidelity geometry. So again, I'll, I'll start start the video here because this one's worth looking at. So we've we've got a bunch of a bunch of tools and just touching on them in, in this video. This is this one's called wrapping. We can start fitting um, manually your geometry to to both your topology results plus your non your non-design geometry. So again, I'm you know, just don't want to spend all day on, on this stuff. But hopefully, you'll get the idea that it's a very um, manual process. Uh, again, you you go through this, and we can get. This is me not trying to um not knowing how to use the video editor. Just fast forwarding to the end of the of the spin. Um, so you can get into very very clean final. Final geometry. You then pull in these together. Um, see me now. I'm just moving. That was protruding. So I'll, I'll do that again. This is this is quite cool. So we've got full history um, tree reconstruction in this. So I found one part was protruding, just moved it back in, and it redid the 
the trim back to back to the original geometry. So you know, very powerful tool in this case. These are just a, a hide contact there, and I can just rerun this in an analysis model. So no real, no huge investment in detailed CAD. So that example there, um, you know, and I'm well practiced. That probably took me 15, 15 minutes. You know, different <laughs> examples take different amount of times. It could be five minutes. It could be be a day sometimes, um, depending on the complexity. But it it's still yeah, a lot cheaper than investing in fully detailed CAD. So you can do that for, you know, you've got a couple of concepts here. I've got the, you know, in, in my mind, I was I was working through two of these concepts, one that might um, be manufactured with SLM, one one with a binder center process, and then start comparing them. So the, the um, you know, the binder center concepts has a much, much higher scale fact, uh, safety factor, but also has, has a, a much, much higher weight. So again, you've, you need to capture um, all this all this information um, to make these good design decisions. So the next step, and again, the next step could be the the um, you know fully featured CAD geometry, and again, this stuff's nonlinear, or it could be your, your print simulation. So I've chosen I'll do the print simulation on on this geometry first. Um, you know, fairly fairly confident that I want to iron out any of these these issues. So with the um, again that that uh, bracket that that JD showed. So we we've got a um, a simulation tool for SLM. Very very easy to to set up. So here's the parts you go through and you find the printer and and everything. Um, and at the end of the process. We, we can look at results like we've got plastic strain on the left and displacements on the right. So what we found is things like the plastic strain and areas of overhangs, you can use it to identify surface quality um, imperfections. So that that's a really, a really um, powerful tool. We've found that in this case, the XY deformation, he showed those snap lines. So if you get, it's almost, you can identify shear where XY displacement will change. Um, at a point, so we we managed to find the, those snap lines within the um, the print simulation, and another with the SLM type process. If you get high Z displacements, which we didn't see, that can that can indicate you could get recoder strike. So you can you know, just start checking those things so you don't don't have you know, problems down the line. So again, on the left, we're seeing we're we're um, adding support structures, which you know gets expensive. Um, we're going going through the process, building the support structures, checking the design, and then at the end we we hit the print. So again, we could we can do a one hour demo on that if if anyone's interested in the process. We we'll have our contact details up at the end. But but again, just showing the process, you want to kind of identify this stuff before you invest in the real detailed, tolerance, expensive uh, CAD. So again, for binder. Uh, binder jet type simulation. Um, we've, we've got a couple of tools. This this is on the verge of being released. Um, we've got quick feasibility checking, so you can look at your design, um, and and we just give a real quick assessment. And this takes seconds seconds to run on whether whether you expect it to deform um, in a safe amount or or a high amount. So it's, it's a bit subjective, and it's not designed as a you know, a final definitive answer. But it can can guide to really um, you know, you know, poor design decisions and and you know, identify things early on. So so in one of these earlier designs, this this part in the middle was was kind of higher and thinner, and one was lower and fatter. So we kind of found a nice compromise. And the um, probably the most powerful thing that um, that we're working on is the compensated shape uh, simulation. So so you know with binder center you print print your green part, and as you center that, it shrinks um, a large amounts of 20% in all directions quite often. So you actually, actually want to print the deformed part, and then, then it, when it, it's compensated, when you when you center it, it um, comes back to the original shape. So that, that's something else we're, we're, um, we're working on, um, and it, it's, it's looking really, really, really good. So, you know, you're, you're, you're confident that your designs are, um, you know, they're manufacturable, um, they're in the ballpark of, of your performance requirements. 
you know you go back and you refer to your DDM it's 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 not just part performance we've on on a project I've been working on we've eliminated <laughs> many parts um, because of the cost and many parts because um, the the um, aesthetic of, of them is, is not appropriate so it's there's so many different um, different aspects and you need need to capture what what's important and some of them some of them are really hard to capture you know aesthetics you might have to just do, do a weighting and somehow um, you know assign that a value so yeah it's, it's really hard but you know hopefully um, designers and engineers that's what we're paid to do we can come up with a decision you know you, you want this bracket it's it, it meets your um design requirements um it's worth taking full detailed CAD so in this case it turned out it was printable um using SLM mass was 207 grams safety factor 2.98 our target was was um three that that's within and within deviation of, of um, manufacture easily um so yeah at this stage you're finally you're finally ready to invest in uh, expensive fully detailed CAD take it back to your CAD system you can again it's sort of two click substitution of your part back into your model for for final design validation so that you know that that's sort of the the entire process um on that one part just wanted to you know LT have been doing this for a long time We've very recently this wasn't a project I worked on it but it was it was last year um, with GVSC um, and I think America's makes was involved in this as well but six different brackets all designed for manufacture with additive um, there's there's you know some incredible weight savings and this this example here it's a five piece bracket down to two piece um, system so you've got that um, simplification which is really good uh, you yeah there's just just lots of different nice examples and you know some of these weight savings um, and they're all you know to maintain or improve performance some of the weight savings are quite um, quite significant like 86 percent in this case and ensures sometimes it's it's switching to a different material and maybe a higher grade but you know, that does give you does give you the option so in total you know 40 42 pounds um, weight saved over six brackets so kind of almost almost at the end um, you know some of some of the takeaways that I that I find you really need to understand your requirements before you embark on on this process um, get the design guides work really closely with whoever's going to be printing um, your part at the beginning you want to be designed to those guides so you don't you don't um waste time and effort you need to constantly track the cost of all but it's even more so than traditional methods you'll you'll end up with more iterations um and you need you really need to track them don't get carried away with with detailed um geometry early in the process um there's a time for it and that's that's at the end um so just just use the appropriate fidelity and probably the biggest thing is there is no single there is no button you know you need you need to iterate you need to be creative and you need to explore so i think i'm okay on time um 10 minutes left i've got some other sort of examples i could work through but we'll um, probably stop here for questions uh so thanks very much hey thanks tony that was that was awesome um because then there are a few questions you know really good questions uh, if you're okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you those uh, here. The first question uh, is from Andreas on the loads from the motion analysis used in topology optimization. The optimized geometry has different motion loads. Do you update the loads and repeat the topology optimization? Uh, I if I understand this, as I think the question might mean because the stiffness of the part changes, so the motion loads change. So the answer at the moment is is no but during the optimization um as as the optimization evolves yes the the stiffness of that part does change so i'm not i'm not sure if that answers the question but i think you, you're almost there but you many times you know we do uh re-optimize the part you know we optimize the part as you mentioned you know you see the results and particular area think oh this should be a should be a non-design space you, know, you don't want to remove the material from there 
So that iteration, I think, happens, right, Tony? And many times I have seen you do a shape optimization as well after do the topology optimization. Yeah, and so that you do the if if you if you're able to, you can do the shape um, towards the at the end. So you've got you know the topology is really finding the the um the architecture of the part. Um, and then there's all you know that's that's the basic layout, and then there's all these other processes of refining that that layout and shape optimization is one of them. Um, and uh, and then uh, of course uh, what one of the so one of the slides you had was validation step. So you optimize the part, and then um, before you know you finalize the design, you are validating that design either by you know crude method or with even for the geometry using the same exact loads to make sure the new design is satisfying the design criteria yep. yes yep so again it's it's important to at every stage represent the physics correctly i i, I think i think that's probably the fundamental that that if you're not representing the physics you're not um you're not solving the right problem. So yes, going going back to this, putting this into the problem um, is, and, and in the system is important. So if if you've got flex bodies for the surrounding parts, you can use, you can use those as well. So it's, um, you know, your level of complexity does matter. You don't always have to get over complicated, but you do need to capture the fundamental physics at every stage. So Perfect. I hope Andreas that answers your question. Again, everyone else, feel free to type in your questions. There's another question from Ben, uh, Tony, about do you have examples of uh, AMDED, that's a directed energy deposition um, process, specifically for path planning and iteration based on process included thermal stresses? I think it's very similar to what uh, one of the MX three D projects. Uh, <laughs> so, so my my next my next slides were the MX three D example. So there, this is the WAM method where they they um it's like a welding deposition method. Um, so no, they they have their own um, path planning and thermal um, distortion prediction software. So the the actual manufacture of the machine, the optimization. Um, was very iterative and, and that was, we were learning, partly it was my fault, um, just learning the requirements. So that's kind of why this was the next in the, in the slide process. But, you know, I went through a lot of iterations to get to get to the final design and it's like balancing sections, minimum and maximum um, cross sections. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, um, you know, ultimately it wasn't really difficult, but learning the process and just stuff like detailing the fillets um, that were required um, was was really important. Um, so yeah, and I don't, I don't know if people have seen this part, but it's it's huge and it's it's uh, shiny, which is the best engineering. And, and I think you no, know, just to add to what Tony mentioned, uh, you know, additive manufacturing or design for additive manufacturing. Is, is, I think, a new stream of maybe a engineering, I would say, maybe not too, maybe just too much about that. But, but the idea is it's not, you know, one tool that answers the question is the knowledge that you have to build is the, you know, the criteria you have to build uh, put in during the design part, during the optimization part that will essentially help you while you know, 3D printing process. There can be multiple different 3D printing processes, but as long as you're following the basics of that process, you know, maybe such as member thickness or, you know, overhang angles, though those you can essentially design for any 3D printing method using, uh, you know, this, this, this process that uh, Tony mentioned, you know, one thing I suggest if you have questions specific about, you know, your parts, products, feel free to ping, uh, send, send a note to Tony. You know, he is doing this for a long time for so many customers developing the, the Design for additive manufacturing processes for you know, OEMs from automotive to aerospace. We'd love to talk to you more and get into the details. Jadeep, there's another question here from VJ. Um, I guess it's directed to either one of you. Um, did you see that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, in terms so of material Tony, properties, can effects of the build direction be considered during the, the TO process? Tony, did you get that? 
Um, yeah, I got the question just isotropic um, at this stage, um, but it has, is something we've we've um, we've discussed. Yeah, so it's it's. And Vijay, one, one way to do that is you know when you assign the material properties, I will always go with the lowest possible uh, of the, the material properties in a particular direction. Even though it's isotropic, you know, you pick a direction and use that number for your topology optimization. That's your worst case scenario. Jadeep and Tony, when, when you're considering like DFAM um, in, in regards to part optimization, and I know some of the parts were that you show there were from an America Makes project. In most cases, I know one of your slides mentioned that, you know, the person has already a mindset of potentially what manufacturing process they want to use and what material they want to use. But with that said, how much in your experience have you seen in regards to optimizing a part for weight reduction that also provides performance is is it more material driven in material selection in regards to the better performance and the weight savings or is it all in the the fact of the design and what additive can provide design wise uh, well i i think just the topology optimization and, and you get a better material layout is is probably the biggest part of it um so, and sometimes switching materials or changing grades can can lead to um, good improvements. But I, I'd say in general, um, and it's just a rule of thumb, that just by changing the topology of your parts, changing the architecture, sort of 20% weight reductions is quite normal. And you do tend to improve the stiffness and reduce the stress as well when you do that. Um, so and, that's when, and if you start changing materials um, and being more creative with different processes, like say switching from a casting to to additive, so you get more flexibility. That's when you start getting the the really big gains, the 40, 50 percent weight reductions. Yeah, and you just hit on like kind of a follow up to that in regards to that. Once you have a design optimized within the software, is it easy to just is it the click of a button to say I want to go from this material to that material and see the differences in, in your in your output, or is it like you know, go back to kind of the beginning because the design's got to change based on the material selection. Uh, right, right, right. Click, right click, and change your material and run it, run it again. Oh, um, great. But, but yeah, and the thing, the thing is, for just say for a so switching between steel and aluminium for for this part on on the screen here, the the general layout, the main members generally doesn't change. It's just how big they'll need to be. Um, <laughs> to to carry the load, um, there there are limits to that, and again, the, the way the topology optimization works, if one member gets so large that you can start eliminating material somewhere else, so it's it's not yeah it's not a perfectly linear thing, um, but it's the, yeah the, these are good questions because it is not a one click solution, and I think anyone that that claims it is 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 kind of selling snake oil. It's um right. it's still a it's really it's probably not a one click solution in regards to if you optimize a part for, you know, the software to kind of spit out, like, you're better off using binder jetting versus, you know, DED or part of it. If you, I mean, the, the, the software is not going to direct you in that regard. You probably got to utilize the software to help determine that. Right. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, I've got another version of the, to get right back to the beginning here of the, the slide JDEC showed. Um, so I'll just keep scrolling. There it is. Oh, there it was. Yeah, the, the, this process here, and it's it just we, you know, we like we like playing down here in the sandbox, looking at looking at different draw directions, looking at different percentages of material, looking at maybe different optimization setups, stiffness versus stress, and you start looking at all these different layouts of material. And especially with no um, manufacturing constraints, you can look at it and go, that could be suitable for casting, or that could be suitable for for um, for binder center. And you know, we're we're working on um, shape um, AI, so kind of um, artificial intelligence kind of things to identify shapes. And and yeah, you know, one of my visions, and it's not going to be immediate, but if you can start 
using some kind of AI to look at a free topology result and identify the best process, um, that would be really useful. But at the moment, um, humans are more intelligent than machines. Gotcha. So um, we got one more really good question in the chat. It came through the chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that one, and I think we'll wrap up for today. Um, so, first of all, she said, thank you very much for a nice presentation. Uh, I work as a materials engineer. Could your software be used for topology optimization of the internal features? For example, if I would like to use a topology optimization approach for optimizing cooling channels uh, for ther uh, thermal fluid optimization of heat exchangers. Oh, that that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Topology, CFT coupled topology. Um, again, it's something something we're very aware of and and are working on. Um, if it's sort of the structural design of the internal channels, um, yes, we can do it. But may, maybe J Deep could comment on this. He might be he's more of a so, CFT person than I am. So uh, yeah, so yes, the you know short answer yes. Is it straightforward or you know couple of button clicks? No, because now we are connecting multiple uh, solvers so like more optimization with fluid dynamic solver you know at altair we have both the solvers and all the technology which can be connected actually one of my opening slides the very first slide have example of protic who which does the injection molding die uh, and it's that optimization was based on the cooling channel not only just the cooling channel the cooling capabilities of of the of the the die itself so we have examples. We have the another you know, the projects we worked on in the past for topology optimization with, along with the CFD or the fluid dynamics. But again, it's it it's uh, it takes some efforts, and I would love to talk to you more. You know, if you want to send a note to us, uh, one of me or Tony will 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 uh, work with you more on that to that topic. All right, great, great. Thank you very much. Oh, hey, here's a here's a great one uh, in the chat. Fantastic presentation, Tony. Thank you for sharing. Standing ovation from Lyft. <laughs> Thank you. Right. One of our from one of our fellow institutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So that's gonna wrap I, up. I can, I can hear the clapping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's gonna wrap up today's uh, TRX webinar. I would like to thank once again, Jadeep and Tony and Scott, thanks for uh, for the introduction and for hosting. Uh, if you do have further questions for the presenters, please reach out to them directly. Uh, you guys, you wanna, uh, Tony, you wanna go ahead and put your, your uh, contact info back up? I should be able to go to slide, but I can't seem to do that. <laughs> I'll give it's you a second of, to get there. It's lots of scrolling. It was scrolling slow because of the videos. There we go. All right, there it is. So yeah, so if you if you want to have uh, further questions or if you're you know you you're interested in anything uh, that Altair has to offer, please you know reach out to them at the contact information on the screen. Um, we do really appreciate the time that you take you know to to log on to these TRX webinars. And if you think if you, if you're if you or your organization would be interested in sharing on the uh, webinar series. Please, uh, you know, go to our website and fill out the form, or you can reach out to, to me, Jason Thomas, at ncdmm.org directly. Uh, thanks again. Everyone have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Jadeep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.